What is up everyone and welcome to my Power Hack G4 Quicksilver build series. This is part number one of five, so you've got four more parts after this one to look forward to. You can expect these videos uploaded over the next two weeks, and if you are watching this after the entire series is live, there is a playlist linked in the video description. Feel free to click on that and you can watch them all in order. This is the series where I take a load of PC parts, stick them in a G4 case, and build an awesome hack and Tosh. So just as one really quick note before we begin, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Todd, Joe, Christian, Matt, and anyone that's donated to this Hackintosh project in any way. The support I get is absolutely amazing, and I couldn't do it without you guys. So to all of you, a massive, massive thank you from me. So this is one of my favorite parts of any build series. This is the part where we take a look at every single component that's gonna go into this system. And I've spent ages lining all of these up to look this awesome, guys, and it's absolutely fantastic to finally see everything that I want in front of me here in this one single frame. And I have to say that it looks absolutely incredible. I'm really enjoying just looking at all this really cool stuff stuff. It's been absolutely ages of planning and thinking about it and saving up and more planning, then video planning and then planning the system again and it's all finally here and I really really think it's going to be awesome. So let's take a look at every single component in detail. We're not going to unbox them in this little section. I'm just going to talk to you guys about each and every single one of them in detail and why I chose them and some little plans that I have to go with them. I'm so excited to finally talk to you guys about every single component directly. So first off we have possibly the most important component of the entire build. This is the CPU. As you guys can tell it's sitting there in its own little wrapper all wrapped up. We are going to unwrap it in this video and stick it in the motherboard and actually put the system together. But in case anyone does not know this is an Intel Core i7 4770. This is not the K version and I don't need the K version because I will not be overclocking in my case. If you can't tell by the title, I'm using a Power Mac G4 case, so there is definitely not enough ventilation to overclock CPU. This CPU is already gonna be kicking out quite a bit of heat, and I may have a little battle on my hands to keep temperatures down, but this is a lovely stock quad-core 3.5 gigahertz Intel Core i7-4770, which is a beast little chip. Coming up, we have the motherboard. This is a Gigabyte Z97M D3H. This is the recommended Micro ATX motherboard to use on the Tony Mac X86 forum, which is, of course, a brilliant, brilliant source of uh, Hackintosh information, especially in terms of components that are compatible with OS X. Gigabyte boards are very, very compatible with OS X, especially the ones that they recommend. And also, Gigabyte are actually my favorite motherboard manufacturer. The, uh, the gaming PC that I built back in 2011, I used a Gigabyte board, and I've always been a Gigabyte fan. I just understand their products. I like their marketing, and I like the way they, I like their website, I like the way it's laid out and that's a big plus when you're researching about a motherboard. I like the boards themselves, I like the features, I like the price to feature comparison ratio, I like everything they offer, I just think they're a great company so I'm really really pleased that Gigabyte boards are the most compatible with Hackintoshes. In terms of this board then, it's a brilliant little Micro ATX motherboard. It's nothing totally special but it's got absolutely everything that I need. It's got four DIMM slots, it's got six SATA, six gigabit a second ports I believe. It's also got two PCIe X16 slots uh, but I think if you use both of them they may run in X8, I'm not 100% sure. It's got all sorts of bells and whistles on it, things that I'll never use, lots of things I will use. Obviously by now it's got 
the obligatory USB 3.0, this, that and the other. It's just a great modern motherboard and definitely the newest board that I've ever used. And the same goes for pretty much every component that you're going to see in this video. We will take a closer look at the motherboard in just a second. Coming over here we have something that I am really, really excited about. This is just your average Corsair Vengeance uh, 1600 megahertz RAM, but I have two 16 gigabyte kits. So that's right, I've got four 8 gigabyte DIMMs and that adds up to a whopping 32 gigabytes. I'd just like to announce that the, the most memory I have in any system at the moment is eight gigabytes. I've got eight gig in my Mac Pro and eight gig in my MacBook Pro. So it'll be absolutely amazing to crank all the way up to 32 gigabytes. It's total overkill, but Thank the, thank the Lord for donations that allow me to do this. This is just incredible. I've had this RAM lying around since the last Hackintosh plans and I'm really, really glad that I can use it in this system. Um, it's just absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to dig it out and, and use 32 gigabytes of RAM and see what that's like. Coming over to the GPU, and this is the most powerful GPU that I've ever owned. This is the Gigabyte GeForce GTX 960. Now, the GPU was a very, very hard decision for me to make. I had to balance a load of different things. I had to balance, uh, most importantly, Hackintosh compatibility, as well as my budget, um, as well as case restrictions in terms of airflow, and of course, the performance that I actually wanted at the end of it after making all of these decisions. Now, after an awesome balance up of video cards and juggling around with different cards for weeks and weeks, I finally settled on this, the Gigabyte GeForce GTX 960. Now, the Gigabyte thing, I do love Gigabyte as you guys know, but I've never had a Gigabyte card. I do really, really like MSI cards. Um, I've always liked them and I really like their products where they have sort of the Hawk series and the Twin Frozer cooler is really cool and all of this stuff. You know, I'm not a massive, massive knowledgeable person on this kind of thing, but um, Gigabyte actually offered, in terms of the 960, the best smallest card for the price. And also this does have a little bit of rear exhaust, I think, which is important for the G4 Quicksilver case. Now, GTX 960, it's not the most powerful card on the planet, but boy, is it way more powerful than my most powerful card I own at the, mo at the moment, which is a GeForce GT 640. This is a wicked card. Of course, two gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's awesome. And if I do want to play games, which is not my main focus of this system at all, this is sort of a video editing type system. System, you know my main workhorse computer for all the YouTube stuff that I do and everything replacing my Mac Pro if I do want to play games the GTX 960 will be just fine at doing so now I am aware before I get people commenting that yes you do need to download the Nvidia web drivers prior to this card being functional in OS 10 when you're using a Hackintosh I am totally fine with that something that people seem to be forgetting quite a lot is I do have integrated graphics available to me to set everything up before I have to download Download the NVIDIA driver to get my graphics card working so that should all run pretty smoothly I hope it does I don't see any issues with it and overall I just cannot wait to use a graphics card this good and this new I treated myself here even though people there are a lot more expensive graphics card graphics cards out there I really did treat myself and I cannot wait Moving on to storage, I wanted to do something extreme. I took my favorite SSD company, which is Samsung, because I have one in my Mac Pro and it's really reliable and I just like them. And I took the best one that they made that I could afford, which is the Samsung 850 Pro. I got the capacity that I wanted, chopped it in half. So 256 gig, chop it in half, 128 gig. And I bought two of them and I'm gonna stick them in RAID 0. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. And even though a lot of people are actually discussing it in my previous videos, in the comment sections and that, where I was talking about these drives, you know, the benefits of SSD RAID 0. Either way, it's something that I've never, ever done before, and I cannot wait to do it. I've got some top-notch, absolute, really high-class, speedy SSDs here that are very expensive. I could have got something a lot cheaper, and I'm gonna whack them together put them in RAID 0 and I'll have a quarter of a terabyte of possibly some of the most fastest SSD storage you can get on a normal SATA connector. And I just cannot wait to see how fast this is going to be. I really, really hope it's going to be blazing. A normal SSD, I've got a Samsung 830 in my Mac Pro. The Samsung 830 is still a blazing fast SSD, but 
I've got the PCI based flash storage in my Mac MacBook Pro and I'd really hope that my desktop can be almost as quick as my MacBook Pro. I know it's probably not going to happen but this is the best that I could do with the budget that I have and this is still really, really top-notch stuff. This will be my operating system, applications, documents, such as you know Word documents, Excel documents, all that kind of thing, and photos, because I've got less than 50 gigabytes of photos. So it'll be all my normal stuff, you know, things like my downloads folder, everything will stay on here. My home folder will stay on this SSD RAID. Uh, but everything else, such as obviously my scratch disk, my media, my iTunes library, and my extensive collection of uh, God knows what, will be stored somewhere else. And uh, by God knows what, I mean various pieces of software and other bits and bobs. I've got nothing exciting, I promise. Well, it is 2015, but we're not quite out of the woods yet. We still have to use hard drives unless we're all totally rich all of a sudden. Hard drives are a necessity and I have chosen my favourite drive of all time to put in this system. But not just one of them, I've chosen two of them. These are two one terabyte Western Digital Caviar Black hard drives. Now at the moment I am using one of these for my scratch disk exactly the same in my Mac Pro. And it's been going since I had my G5 back in 2010. So it's been going wonderfully and it's been pumping out every single video you guys have seen since then, apart from a little break in the middle where I used it as an iTunes drive while I was using a 2 terabyte black. Now, even though this is a really speedy drive, it's still just a hard drive and people have been spoiled, including myself, by the speed of SSDs. One thing I would love is a faster performance in terms of my scratch disk. So this is why you see two one terabyte drives. They are also going to be put together in RAID 0 and used just as my scratch disk. Now these two drives plus the two SSDs are going to be the only drives in the box. That is four drives, but considering the amount of drives I use now, that's not a lot. So everything else is going to be either on the server or external. My iTunes library will be on an external drive and everything else will be on the server, which is absolutely awesome. I'll have a very simple drive setup, only two visible drives in the OS on the system. That'll be my boot drive and my scratch disk. Both be RAID 0 setups. The scratch disk, very, very fast Western Digital Caviar Blacks. I'm hoping that they're not going to be too loud, um, but time will tell. I don't have massive problems with my ones at the moment, and I will be taking precautions in terms of case dampening and whatnot to make sure that they don't vibrate throughout the entire case. But here we are, two one terabyte Western Digital Caviar Blacks, the best scratch disk I've ever owned. Now, powering all this awesome stuff, I have something that I am so excited to use, and I've got a feeling that this guy is going to be with me for years and years. This is the Seasonic P760 80 Plus Platinum Certified Power Supply. This thing is nothing short of an absolute beast. Now, you may be thinking, Tom, what the hell, man? 760 watts is total overkill for this system. Yes, but the Power Mac G4 Quicksilver case, or any Power Mac case for that matter, apart from the G5, has extremely restrictive airflow for modern PSUs that use a giant fan on the side. Now, for this reason, the PSUs are going to run hotter than they would in a PC. Not an ideal scenario, but all you have to do to sort that out to a certain degree is to get an overkill PSU because these PSUs are certified and designed to power up to 760 watts worth of devices. If you're only giving it two, 300 watts at max out, then obviously it's going to have a lot of headroom so the PSU isn't going to get as hot. So even though it's overkill in terms of numbers, it's still necessary for this build because of the restriction of airflow. Now a lot of people said, get a fanless PSU then you won't have to worry. Well, that is another matter because a fanless PSU requires very good case ventilation, something else that the Power Mac case does not have. So you're actually better off getting a higher wattage PSU with a fan on it rather than a fanless one. Because it's fanless, it actually means that it's going to run on average hotter than a PSU with a fan. It's just fanless because it can cope with that with its own internal thermal design. But if that internal thermal engineering does not get enough airflow, which it will not in the Power Mac case, then it is not going to perform so good and it would probably blow out on me and I really don't want that. So I've got this Seasonic PSU. If you guys have never heard of Seasonic, then they are a wonderful power supply company. They make extremely, extremely well-regarded 
high quality power supplies. You know, I know a lot of people jump on the Corsair bandwagon and just go Corsair all the way or whatever, you know, there are other options out there and in terms of everything added together, this P760 80 plus platinum certified PSU by Seasonic was a must have for me. Also, because it's 80 plus platinum certified, that means that it is very, very efficient. So of course, it's nice to keep a really low electricity bill when a system is running as much as my system is. So moving on to cooling this system, this was a massive, massive task to try and calculate what it's gonna be like. You're always focusing on hypothetical situations well, when building in a less than ideal case. And I did decide to go for a closed loop liquid cooler for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, the power supply clearance with the motherboard means that you'd have to use a very low profile cooler. The Intel stock cooler only just fits. So when you look at low profile coolers designed for sort of mini ITX cases, they don't really deliver enough cooling performance for such a high end chip like the 4770. So if you use a closed loop cooler, that means that without any clearance issues, of course, because the water block is a lot smaller than something like a cooler, uh, an actual C an air cooler with a fan on it, then you run into much, much less problems with clearance. Everything is tied during the case. And also because it's a liquid cooler, yes, they are a little more expensive, but you'll be getting on average better temperatures with a less volume. So I am very excited to use this liquid cooler. Specifically, this is the Cooler Master Sidon 120V version two. Now I did weigh up all of the different closed loop liquid coolers out there. Um, a single 120 mil radiator was pretty much my only choice for this case. I, put a, I could have put a dual rad in the bottom, but then that would have meant that I'd have to sacrifice my original hard drive mounting, which is something that I didn't want to do. And considering that I'm not going to be overclocking, this should be absolutely fine because it's a closed loop it should be pretty much the majority totally independent from the case because I'll be sucking in cold air from outside or blowing out I haven't decided yet it's gonna be sort of an experiment type thing um, all the variables decided and all the factors looked at I did settle on this Cooler Master, like I said in the unboxing, I did all the research and I decided to get this Cooler Master unit because for the price and the performance and the uh, just the general awesomeness of the cooler, it was better than anything else I could find for my needs. Now I'm not saying that this is the best closed loop water cooler on the market, uh, probably far from it, but for everything that I needed, this is what I went for and I'm really looking forward to using it because it's not my first liquid cool system, but it's my first closed loop cool system so I'm really looking forward to seeing how easy they are to set up because everyone says they are extremely easy now it comes with a fan but I will be not using the original fans let's take a look at what I've got here we have two of the best fans in the industry or at least some of the best these are Noctua NFF12 fans and they are the new design slightly less ugly than the old ones so I'm gonna be using one of these on the CPU cooler and one of these as a case fan. Now the NFF12 is an ideal radiator fan, but it's not so good as a case fan. It's still very good, but initially I was gonna put both of these on the radiator, but now I've decided to use one as a case fan. It's not gonna impact things that much and I'm still really, really looking forward to using some of the best fans in the industry in my system. I will probably use them both with a low noise adapter. I'm not 100% sure yet. All of that kind of configuration is still left up in the air to see what temperatures are like once the system is built. But there they are, awesome, awesome Noctua fans. I've never used Noctua before. Obviously everyone rants and raves about them. They are extremely expensive. I think they're about 25 pounds per fan. So that's 50 pounds sitting right there. And I already had fans. I've got 120 mil fans coming out of my ears but I wanted to go knock to it. I wanted this to be extreme. This is a pretty extreme build as you guys probably noticed by now. Here they are right in front of me here. Never used them. They weigh a ton, but yeah, cannot wait. They should, they should perform really, really well. Making a start on some of the more sort of small indirect components, here I have my pen drive. I did not own a very good pen drive to install um, UniBeast and MultiBeast and install OS X and all this stuff, so I wanted to pick up a nice big good one. This is my first ever USB 3.0 drive. This is a Patriot drive, 16 gigabytes. It's nothing special, but I am really looking forward to using it. And yes, I will use it in a USB 2.0 slot when I do my installs, because apparently there are some issues with USB 3.0 
installs, which does not surprise me. But I wanted the USB 3.0 drive anyway, just to see what they're like. Curiosity got the better of me, and there it is. My first ever USB 3.0 drive, and I definitely needed one. Coming down, we have a regular PCI Firewire 400 card. Now, one thing about modern motherboards is they don't normally come with Firewire these days, as you guys know, because, you know, it's, it's being phased out on the consumer end of things. So, here's a Firewire 400 card. As you guys know, I still use the Apple iSight, so it's very important for me to have a Firewire card, and I also like Firewire as an interface. Now, of course, this was donated to me, as you guys probably remember. I would like a Firewire 800 card as well, but that may be something for the future if I can get a combination card. But this will be great for now. As long as it works in the Hackintosh, it'll be absolutely fine for using my Apple iSight webcam, and that's all I need it for now. My Firewire 800 external drives are actually connected to the server, so that makes no difference to me on the desktop anyway. So one thing you should never do, in my opinion, is put lights inside a Mac. If I put lights inside of this Power Mac case, it would be pointless. I'd close the door, and you would not be able to see any kind of glow whatsoever. But I'm in a bit of a predicament because I love custom building PCs and I love lights. I really love lights. As you guys know, my, my main job is all focused around lights. I absolutely love lights and things that look cool. So I'm in a bit of a dilemma. Can't put lights inside my new system I'm building, but I love lights. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna drill a hole in the bottom of the case and stick these guys on the bottom. These are Bitphoenix Alchemy LED, LED strips. They are an awesome way for case lighting, but they should provide an awesome glow underneath the case. I was gonna use them inside the case in my last Hackintosh build, but I'm gonna have them under the case in this build and it should glow from under the Power Mac and I cannot wait to see what that looks like. I actually saw this being done years and years ago when people still use Power Mac G4s as main pro desktops. Someone put a cold cathode on the bottom and it glowed out the sides. It looked absolutely awesome. So I'm hoping for a similar effect. These should look really cool. At the moment, my plan is to mount my SSDs right next to my motherboard on the motherboard tray. So for that, I wanted some extremely short but flexible SATA cables, and I got just that. These SATA cables are so short, but they're round, so they're really, really easy to bend around things. So they should be great if I do end up mounting my SSDs where I originally thought. If not, I'm sure they'll come in handy in the future. Talking of mounting SSDs, here we have some really thick, one meter in length, and I I think, I don't know, 50 centimeters, um, five centimeters wide. I'm not, hang on, let me measure it here on camera. Let's get the ruler out. That's it, five centimeters wide. So that's 50 millimeters wide, uh, industrial grade Velcro. This is for mounting SSDs. It's probably the easiest way to do it in a less than ideal case. Cannot wait to see if they actually stay stuck. Here we have a little godsend from Wilkinson's, believe it or not, guys. These are sticky adhesive um, cable tie loops. So if you've got a case that does not have any loops for cable ties, like the G4 Quicksilver, you can use these, stick them anywhere, and that gives you really easy cable tie loops to, uh, to cable tidy, cable manage, organize a cable mess, all that kind of thing. They will definitely be needed. I have actually used similar products to this in other things, not computers, but other things, and they work really, really well. So I'll definitely need these Wilkinson's of all places. I do recommend going there and taking a look at some of their handy little things they've got like this because they've got all sorts and it's handy having it local. Next up, I have a load of motherboard headers, switches, and positive and negative wire. This will come in handy for a few different reasons. I need to use the wire to modify the front little circuit board for the power LED and power button to work with my motherboard and I'll need the headers for that as well obviously but because I'm doing a test bench build these are actually wired up power buttons so instead of jabbing my motherboard with a screwdriver all the time I can actually use a proper button to restart and power on the system which will actually be quite appealing and over here we have a 120 millimeter black fan guard now I'm not sure that I'm going to be using this because I did order this when I planned to use two fans one either side of the radiator but you never know it may still come in handy. So three items that arrived after I filmed the intro, we have a tube of Arctic Cooling MX4 thermal paste. This is very good thermal paste, performs very well, and I know it well, so I just decided to plump for a tube of this. I got a full tube, even though I've got some other thermal paste lying around, and my cooler comes with thermal paste, I thought I'd grab some because it's likely that I'll be taking the cooler on and off the CPU quite a few times, so I thought I need a dedicated tube. I've also got myself another pair of Gigabyte SATA cables. They're exactly the same as the ones that come with the motherboard, but I needed them because I wanted another right angle connector to go up to the second hard drive. So here we have another 
another awesome little accessory. This is a USB 3.0 front panel header with a cable that terminates in a PCI backplate with two USB 3.0 connectors on it. This is ideal if you want to make the most out of all the USB 3.0 ports that your motherboard has to offer and you don't have front USB 3 on your case. And of course, last but not least, we have the Power Mac G4 Quicksilver case. Now, I believe this is the first time that someone has ever done a detailed Hackintosh build inside a Power Mac G4 case on YouTube. So I'm hoping to make this a really good series and really detailed and easy for you guys to follow. Here we have the case, it's not in perfect condition, but I do have another donor case for any parts that are a bit scuffed up on this one, I can swap it out. Now case modification isn't until part three of this series, so please head on to part three if you're only interested in customizing a G4 case, but please stick around if you want to see an awesome computer build and I strongly recommend doing so. So this is my favorite ever computer case design. I love it to pieces and I cannot wait to have this as my main desktop. It's going to be so, so exciting. But that's it about the case for now. Like I say, more case goodness in part three. So guys, it is time to start building. Here we have our three main components of the system that we have to prepare first. This is motherboard preparation. We've got the motherboard itself, the RAM and the CPU. Let's put the RAM and CPU to one side for now and take a look at the motherboard. So here it is, the Gigabyte Z97M D3H. Micro ATX Z97 Socket 1150 Intel motherboard by Gigabyte. Absolutely wonderful board, cannot wait to use it. Cannot wait to see what it's like. Of course, ultra durable, uh, ultra durable. There's the back. There's the board, but of course we'll take a look at that in person. Let's open up the box. And one thing I love about this is we have a secret message from, uh, from Joe there, which is absolutely wonderful and pretty hilarious. When I first saw that, that was awesome. So here we have the board itself. That's the first thing we see. We'll move the board to one side for now. And you don't get a lot with this guy, but you don't need a lot. You get your SATA cables, two of those there. Motherboard manual and other documentation along with the IO shield, which is just a plain silver IO shield So that is everything that you get with this board. Let's close it up Actually, we'll leave it open for now because I'm gonna unwrap the board and then I'm gonna put the anti-static bag back in the motherboard box to keep safe So here we have it, here is the motherboard. This is my first look. Okay, let's get this anti-static bag out of the way. In the box, because I like to keep everything just in case I want to upgrade or sell on in the future. And there we have it, there is our motherboard. Wow, looking absolutely wonderful, guys. This is on our, of course, free test bench being our um, motherboard box, here it is. So taking a basic look at the board, you can see we have our Intel socket, we have the four DIMM slots, we have four PCI slots, these are a PCI EX16 and these are regular PCI. Quite a nice layout here because if you have a double slot card, then you can either install a normal PCI card or a PCI E card there. Um, coming round, we have two right angle SATA connectors and four normal SATA connectors. There's our 24 pin, there's our eight pin up there, and everything is looking hunky-dory, I would say, guys. On the back of the board, we have usual connectors, two USB 2.0, PS2, DVI, VGA, HDMI, four USB 3.0, gigabit ethernet, and audio output. Now, only one thing I do have to say about this board, guys, is for some strange reason, it does look a little bit bent from the get-go. Um, it is definitely not as thick 
as other ultra durable boards that I have seen in the past and it is actually a little bent just from eyeballing it and that is plain when you put it on the motherboard box which is interesting but hopefully everything is okay and if I do have any troubles hopefully Joe has the receipt. So it is time to prepare this motherboard to go in the system. So here we have the Intel Core i7 4770. Let's open it up. Here is the CPU looking absolutely wonderful. Now this is a used CPU guys, so what I'm gonna do is clean off all of the old thermal paste which is stacked up around the CPU a little bit and make sure that the surface is totally clean before we put it in the socket. So one of the best ways to clean off a CPU is with these. These are Arctic Clean 1 and 2. You use number one first and this basically dissolves and gets rid of any thermal grease, um, any old thermal grease. You leave it on there for 30 to 60 seconds and then you wipe it off with a lint-free cloth obviously and then number two you apply and to prepare the surface for the new thermal compound or thermal pad or pre-applied thermal grease or whatever. Now I've got number one sitting on here at the moment and I've got these fantastic little lint-free lens cloths which are ideal to wipe off from the CPU because they absorb a lot of liquid and as you can hopefully see that is making the surface extremely clean. So there is a fairly clean looking CPU. So now all I've got to do is apply number two and I'm going to use a brand new cloth to wipe off the residue of number two to put this in the socket. Now I hope that I don't have to remove the cooler and reapply the cooler a lot of times um, but we will see how it goes. So a few drops of number two and a wipe with this cloth. Let's see how we get on. Number two, this prepares the surface. A couple of big generous drops on there. Close that up. And obviously, nice circular wipe motions to really clean the surface of the CPU which is great. Now obviously if your CPU is brand new, you won't need to do this, but hopefully you can tell on camera that this has come out very, very nicely. Perfect, there we have it. Surface of the CPU looking really nice and clean. Now I'm gonna keep all of that safe over there to use if I ever need to take the cooler off the CPU, which I have a feeling I may need to do. So here we go, time to slot the CPU into the motherboard. Let's pull the little lever back, open it up, open the socket, and there we have the Intel socket revealed. Looking absolutely wonderful, I may add, guys. Perfect stuff, and this is exactly where our CPU slots in. So let me just have a quick inspection of the socket. Okay, let's plop our CPU down in there. Remember, zero insertion force. There it is. Let's replace this little flap down on the socket like so, and then a nice bit of force. Getting this one down in place, that cover popping off, that one under there, boom, that is our CPU installed in the socket. Looking rather wonderful, I may add. Perfect, sorry if my uh, hair was in the shop there at any given time guys I do have to look very closely in the frame to see what's going on so there it is Intel 4770 sitting in the motherboard. It's time to move on to something a little less scary and that is installing the RAM. Here we have our two packs Corsair Vengeance 32 gigabytes in total cannot wait to see what it's like running 32 gigabytes in a system guys that is just absolutely colossal amount of RAM. I just have never ran anything close to it. Like I said earlier in the video, eight gigabytes is the most that I've ever ran in any system. So I'm just really looking forward. So all of our sticks come out separately. Let's get them all out then, might as well. Let's get this one out too. And it's so nice to finally be opening these guys. I've had these for ages and ages. Ever since I said I was going to do the last Hackintosh and I have not used them. Eight gigabytes each. This is just beyond crazy. So here we have them, Corsair Vengeance, looking absolutely wonderful. And they all come in nice plastic packaging. 
The black ones are my favourite, I really do like them. Let's open up all the slots to get ourselves ready. Let's put the first one in. These are actually taller than I remember them, guys. I did initially put a stick of this in my parents' PC that I built them. There's one stick. But I've now changed that out for my old Patriot signature memory that was in my gaming PC because I wanted them to have dual channel and they were having a little bit of memory related issues for some reason, I'm not too sure why. So here is, if I can get it in, stick number two. Oh, this is, this is looking good guys, this is looking really good. Stick number three. Now this RAM looks a lot nicer in person than it does in pictures. I'm not the biggest fan of uh, the look of Corsair Vengeance in pictures, but it does look really good in person, especially the black. The black is just very black, which is nice. It matches the board. And also the Vengeance um, logo on, on the sticks themselves actually sort of resemble the gold heat sinks on the motherboard. So there we are, that is 32 gigabytes of RAM installed, which is absolutely colossal. And the weight of the board has now increased quite a lot. Um, now I've just realized that I've got, I'm gonna be installing the cooler on this one as well, or at least the mounting hardware for the cooler. So I don't know if that's gonna get in the way, but it's no big deal if I have to whip them out and back in again. So with the motherboard out of the spotlight for a second, let's take a look at this cooler. Now of course, as you guys know, I am not building in the case straight away, as I've mentioned. So that means that having this water cooler dangling off the motherboard while the motherboard is on the motherboard box may be less than ideal, but I'll be very, very careful moving all this stuff around. It's pretty much essential that I don't break anything because I don't have any spares of this stuff. So I really want to keep everything in tip-top condition. Um, so. Let's open her up, and wow, this looks fairly simple, guys. Wow, okay, this looks really, really cool. So, we have a nice box with everything nicely presented, and it looks like we have what looks to be the included fan, which is meant to be a really good fan, but I am still replacing it. We have the instructions and whatnot, which I will definitely need to install this. And then we have under here, all the mounting hardware, so all this. It does come with a tube of thermal grease, but I will be using MX4, as you guys know. You got all this stuff, all this mounting gubbins, three different back plates. Wow, this is gonna take a lot of figuring out for me, considering I don't mount CPU coolers that often. And then, of course, we have the cooler itself. So there is the radiator, a lot lighter than I was expecting, and the combined water block and pump. So that is it for that. Let's move that over there. Keep the instructions out. Put the fan back. And let's have a little look at this. So dangling off here, we have the single four pin connector, or is it a three pin? It looks to be a three pin. Yeah, it's a three pin. And that would be plugged into the CPU fan header uh, that is the pump power, and then of course I'll power the fan separately. Now, eyeballing this, guys, blinking heck, I really, really hope it fits properly in my case. Wow, this could be a bit of a could be a bit of a stretch, but anyway, um, here we have the radiator, much lighter than I was expecting, and of course the water block with combined pump. It does have a little protective thing over it. Um, which is a nice weight and a, and a fair size as well, but clearance um, still shouldn't be an issue, which is great. Um, so, I am going to figure all of this out, try and mount the mounting hardware, and when you see me back in the next clip, I should have um, at least the backplate mounted, hopefully. All right, guys, so this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. It was just a case of feeding these screws through the backplate, putting little clips on them, and now they're sitting here. And I think all I have to do now is plop the cooler on top and do up the nuts. But of course, first, we'll need to apply thermal compound. So, so that I can get a clear idea of temperatures and whatnot, when I first boot up the system, I'm gonna use thermal paste that I actually want to be using all along, and that is my um, Arctic Cooling MX4. So here it is in all of its glory. Brilliant. Now, of course, naturally, just take 
that off and it is time to apply a tiny little Now that is actually a little bit too much, but we will leave it like that for a second. It's not too much, it's just a little bit less less grainy of ricey than I'd like, but that's okay. That'll do guys for now. Now what I'm going to do now is of course remove the protective film on the bottom of the cooler. Like so, so it's important that after we remove this, we, we don't touch it. And as you can see, I've already snapped the mounting hardware onto the cooler itself, onto the water block. So the only thing that makes this a little bit tricky to maneuver is the fact that you've got this big swinging radiator hanging from it. But let's plop this down and see how we get on with this. This should just line up and plop down. All right, guys, so I think we have it sitting on there. That was a bit tricky to maneuver, and it's really hard with this radiator moving all over the place. But we have it, oh gosh. It is really, it's a little bit tricky to get it sitting there nicely, but that's okay. What I'm now gonna do is tighten up, just get some nuts on there so it doesn't ping off. Let's get these little nuts on the side. One there. Of course, don't need it very tight at all at the start. Get one under there if I can. The pipe's coming out the side of the block are quite firm to turn, guys, so. There we go. Okay, that's in a nice position now. The radiator is sitting nicely for us to for us to work with. That's great. Okay, so that was definitely a nice bit of excitement. Let's get all four on here. And one thing I love about this cooler, guys, is how badass the mount looks. The fact that it's got silver on it, on the top, really looks cool, in my opinion, so. One last one to get on, then we can go around tightening. So this was a lot easier than expected. And actually, I took quite a while doing it because I thought it was meant to be harder, so I thought I was doing it incorrectly. This is my first time mounting one of these and I just can't get over how easy it was. Um, and it's the same back plate for both Intel and AMD. I will probably have to use a screwdriver. This is a flathead screwdriver, guys, so I'm going to be very careful with this because obviously a flathead by nature, if you're not used to using one, is easier to, um, it pops out easier. And I'm actually going to grab a small one from my bag. I've actually got an ideal little screwdriver, guys, here. I just don't know if it's a little bit too small. Ah, I can feel that already from my fingers, that has got quite tight. Brilliant. So here we have it. Now, even if I do have to whip this on and off, this cooler, I feel very confident about doing that. Um, now that I know that it, how easy it is to take on and off. So that's okay. And I've got plenty of thermal grease. Plenty of thermal grease cleaner and CPU surface cleaner. And that is great, that is on there guys. So that is the motherboard and cooler complete, apart from getting a fan on here. So that's what we'll do now. We'll unbox one Noctua fan and see where we get with that. So let's shift that off to one side and bring a Noctua fan into the picture. So let me see how to open this. I failed opening this in my unboxing video, but it is just very stiff and that's why. So here we have it. 120 mil, Whew. lovely, lovely quality fan. Nicest quality fan I've actually felt, to be honest. Now, by the looks of it, it doesn't come with a low noise adapter, but that's okay. There it is, gorgeous. Lovely, lovely stuff here, guys. 
and it's got four mounting screws but we won't need those because we use the ones that came with the radiator and here we have an NFF12 really nice knock to a fan these um, bits on the side are actually rubbery so really good for keeping vibration down so pleased about that really really cool so what I'm gonna do guys is attach this to the radiator and see where we go with that. There we have it everyone, our motherboard preparation with the cooler is totally complete. We have the Noctua NFF12 sitting on our radiator, absolutely fantastic, as well as all the cables plugged in. That is us, totally done with the board and we are nearly ready to power up the system. But first, we've got to spend some really exciting time taking a look at the power supply and the SSDs before we power it up. It's a glorious time folks, it's time to take a look at this absolutely wonderful power supply. So, I can find my knife. First things first, we've got to cut all the plastic that is covering this box to see if we can then rip it off. So, let's cut through that, and cut through that, and here we go, time to dig in. I would just like to note everyone that this box, calling it heavy, for a power supply would be an understatement. This weighs loads. This weighs actually probably about the same amount of weight as my parents' entire computer. The one that I built with the uh, AMD APU setup and the uh, Corsair CX430. So here we have it, the Seasonic 760P or P760 80 plus platinum certified PSU. Let's open it up and boom. Here we have it guys, wow, this is looking great. So first off, we have a lovely Seasonic instruction booklet. Let's flip through that. Loads and loads of stuff in there. As, pro as well as probably specific measurements of this PSU, I think they do that. Not 100% sure though, but it's all organized absolutely wonderfully. Here we have the Seasonic modular cable bag. Now I am shocked to see that this is not that sort of nice velvet um, that they used to use, but this is still really nice. This is kind of like a, a non-velvet, but, but really nice bag, and it does come with a UK um, kettle lead right in the back there, but as you guys know, I'll be using an actual PowerMac G4 kettle lead. So we'll take a look at all the modular leads in a second. In the side then, we have this little bag, which includes four power supply screws, it includes one, two, three, four, five cable ties, a powered by Seasonic case badge, as well as what looks to be Velcro cable ties, or, yeah, I think they are, either that or foam pads, but I think they're Velcro cable ties. And then, of course, open this, ah, this is the, where the velvet bag comes in, okay. This isn't a velvet bag, this is a normal bag. This is the velvet bag, this is cool, okay, guys, so. Lifting it up, the power supply is in this awesome velvet bag with this shiny Seasonic logo. This is the platinum Seasonic logo on it. This is, this is just quality, guys. This is gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. I love it. This is this kind of attention to detail is wonderful. Obviously, they could charge a lot less for the power supply if they didn't include um, things like this. A lot of people think they're unnecessary, but I just think this is part of the experience. Absolutely gorgeous bag, and in here we have the power supply, boom, here it is, bloody hell, this is a nice piece of kit, really, really nice, wow, this is such a good looking power supply, really, really cool guys, I'm very pleased with this already, absolutely wonderful, okay, let's put that to one side, and we will put the bag in there for safekeeping, we will put the instructions and those included bits and bobs in there for safekeeping and we will take a look at all of the cables included so moving the box to one side let's take a little look at what we've got going with the cables okay so as i showed you guys it comes with a nice kettle lead nice quality and then the rest is velcro so we seem to have two compartments one this side now these are disposable bags Disposable plastic bags, of course. You don't need to keep these. In here, we have what looks to be a six pin PCI connector, a six to eight pin PCI or eight to six, 
Another eight to six. Another six to six. The main 24 pin motherboard power cable, as well as an eight to eight pin. So we need both of those. Let's keep those separate. And another eight to eight. So there's two eight to eight pins, which is cool. Let's slot those in there. And taking a look in the other side. We have, this is cool guys, we have, let's take a look, two Molex connectors, we have one, two SATA connectors on one stem there, that might be quite nice to use, we'll keep that there for the SSDs. We have one stem with one, two, three, what well, looks to be one, two, three, four SATA connectors on it, which is nice. We have another stem with one, two, three Molex connectors. And we have this one that has one, two, three, four SATA connectors and a Molex to floppy connector. So that is awesome. Very, very pleased with that, of course. Closing that up. That is everything we need for now. I'll use the original kettle lead for now. We'll use the 24 pin, we'll use the 8 pin and um, a couple of SATA power cables for the SSDs. Absolutely awesome, awesome PSU. Talking of SSDs, we might as well dive in to one of these. And I'm gonna plug them both in because as you guys know, next part is installing OS 10 and I need them both to install OS 10. Oh man, excitement is building even more. Here we have it, so simple. We have documentation as well as software that we don't need obviously and then the 850 Pro itself which is a very nice looking SSD nice and small of course it's got a nice silver trim around it which makes it look very very high class obviously very lightweight let's put that over there and put these in here for safekeeping and of course we want to find out if there is an actual SSD in box number two let's take a look Here we have it, 850 Pro times two, both 128 gigabytes, absolutely wonderful drives. Cannot wait to get those fired up together. It's gonna be everything, everything is gonna be so, so sweet. There they are, right then guys, I'm gonna wire together our little test bench. Let's wire it together, together if that makes sense. Wire it together, together, whatever. Let's put it together and, and see how far we get. So as the lovely evening sun draws in, I'm getting ready to power up my system for the first time. Now, I've already connected a power switch. I've got this cool little doobry here that powers it up. I think these are really cool. Um, you can grab them on eBay if anyone's interested. And I have a DVR, USB and audio plugged in from my KVM um, B side which is very handy, so I've got that there, test bench all plugged in, so it'll be coming up on my uh, main monitor. Now a couple of things that I have left to do is of course plug the power supply into everything and plug in both of the SSDs, so that is what we're going to do now. Starting with the main 24 pin connector. Now, like I said, the sun is setting wonderfully outside, it's all very very nice, and it, I couldn't think of a better time to be doing this. Now, one interesting thing about this connector is for some strange reason it's split up into 18 pins and, or is it, no, 16 pins plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is interesting. Or, what is that? So, interestingly enough, guys, there is actually 26 pins on one end of this connector, so I assume that goes in the PSU end. I'm just going to plug my end into the motherboard. And one thing I really like about this cable, guys, is because it's Seasonic quality, it's sleeved right down to the ends, which is such a nice touch. So if I bring the power supply over here, it should show us where we're plugging in. Ah. Okay, so this is interesting, guys. It's, it is split up totally two different connectors to connect the motherboard to the PSU, but it does say MB on both of the motherboard connectors, so that is interesting, and uh, yeah, it kind of makes kind of makes sense. So next thing we'll do is connect the CPU connector, um, which I have left where? Oh, it is here. Cool, eight pin and two four pins, great. 
is very, very good. Now this isn't the longest of cables, so I'll probably need an extension. I do have one somewhere. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just pick any one of these because they're both labelled up the same. And then we will plug this in to our connector on the motherboard. Great. So that is the power supply connected to the board. Just one more quick thing to plug in and that is two SATA connectors for the SSDs and they plug into a six pin which is over here and we can now move our power supply back over here out of the way. Now it's important to test everything outside of the case guys um, but I don't have much of an option at the moment because my Quicksilver case is not ready um, but there we go, that's everything sitting there fairly neatly. Radiator's got plenty of breathing room leaned up against the bottom of the motherboard box, which is nice. So hopefully now our SATA connectors reach the SSDs, which I think they will. Great, perfect positioning. So, two SSDs, and we have these short little SATA cables to use, which are ideal for this kind of thing. There's one. Here's two, so plugging them into the drives. One there. These are so little guys, really, really little. And one there. And same on the board. Or it would probably be easier to plug them into power first while I'm here. One SSD plugged into power and now plugged into the board any second. Great, and then this one plugged into power there and plug in the board great so that is two SSDs connected to this test bench. Now let's move everything over as much as possible to there and that allows me to move my mouse. Now all I've got to do is plug this into the mains and give it its first boot which is an incredibly exciting process. So the moment of truth guys. Let me turn the power supply on and then turn the board on. So I'll 3, 2, 1 for both of them just so it's the ultimate excitement. Power supply switching on, three, two, one, go. Okay, that is the PSU on. And now with this little button, let's turn on the system. Three, two, one, go. And boom, we are up, which is incredibly exciting. Now just waiting for some display, of course. On the center monitor waiting for it to do something. Hang on a second, am I on the right? Yes! Oh, okay guys, we are here. Reboot and select your proper device. Okay, so for some reason. Now let's power up again. My monitor's being a bit fussy with its inputs. Oh, it's because I got a VGA plugged in as well. Okay guys, I was being a blithering idiot, pressing the wrong key. The awesome thing is it sees both of the SSDs, which is incredible, or enter setup. And let's enter setup right now. There we have it, boom, we are in. Okay, sweet guys, this system is working. So it says, welcome, choose the system default language. Wow, okay, now I've never really used one of these before. I believe my parents has a UA UFI BIOS, but it's a little different to this. All right, guys, so just checking it out here. As you can see, 32 gigs of RAM and 3.4 gigahertz i7-4770, which is sweet. Now, I know you guys are probably dying for me to continue, but I am afraid that is the end of this particular part.